Hey, welcome to Service Online. My name's Cody, I'm one of the worship leaders here, and I just wanna say I am so excited that you're joining us. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, um, as you're listening to this, as you're watching online, I just wanna encourage you, be intentional in this time, meet with God, grow in relationship with Him. For now, let's join together in worship. I sing praises to your name. I praise to your name. The name that's so much higher than all names. Sing all on, all on to your name a name that's so much greater than all names to be lifted up be lifted I sing praises to your name, praises to your name, the name that's so much higher than all these. All
So today we are wrapping up a series that we have been in uh, all through the month of September. And today is the last message in this series. Uh, and it's been called, The Bible Doesn't Say That. And we have been looking at those things that we kind of culturally somehow think, oh, I'm sure that's in the Bible. And then we find out, oh, that's not what the Bible actually has to say. And our goal in this series was not to give you Bible trivia so that you could go you know, win a couple arguments with some people, but it's so that we can begin to see deeply God's truth to us. Because God comes to extend grace to us but also truth, grace and truth, hand in hand. Like we, you can't go one without the other. So he comes to give us grace, but we want to understand what God's word really has to say to us, especially in this day and age when, again, culture is speaking so loudly to us and sometimes our own philosophies that we've come to somehow internalize. Sometimes it's even just our own feelings. Like, well, we kind of want something to be true or something doesn't quite feel right, so we kind of twist and shift things, but the question really is, what does the Bible have to say? And in that, what we find is not just truth, but we find life. And we actually find out who God really is and who, who we really are. And so we come to new places when we begin to understand that. So, so we've been diving into that a little bit because we don't want to cloud or taint what God actually wants to speak to us. So if you've missed any of the messages in this series, I would encourage you to go into our YouTube channel uh, and you can watch all these. But today, we're gonna dive into uh, a statement that you've probably said before. I know I think I've said it before, so it's one of those challenging things. But let me start with uh, a question for you. Have you ever helped somebody move? Yeah. Everyone been in that boat, you know? And you show up and, and I don't know what your role is. Mine is always <laughs> furniture and couches and different things like that. And of course, I've had the the honor of inviting people to help me move some things as well. And uh, we, we live in, uh, kind of over by Turlock High School here in town, and we live in an old house. It's actually coming up on 100 years old, and we actually have a basement. Like, you don't see that very much anymore. We have a basement, like actually finished, like, you know, livable kind of a thing, and there's a staircase going down in it. And so for some unknown reason to me at a certain point. Uh, my wife and I, we had a couch that was down there and it was a hide-a-bed couch, right? Have you ever moved a hide-a-bed couch? It's like the worst, right? And so I asked my neighbor, now this is, this is a number of years ago. Uh, I say that because I still owe him. See, if anyone helps you move a hide-a-bed couch, you owe them like forever. And so we're, we're kind of bringing this up the stairs. And since I'm tall, I'm always on the low end of things to help, you know, kind of get up a little bit. So we're going up the stairs and it's not a long staircase, but we're going up and then it curves, you know, or, or turns halfway. And so I'm doing the whole pivot thing, you know, pivot, you know, we're, we're trying to get around the corner and then, the bed part comes out, <laughs> right? And so it's like, you're stuck in there and it's like, oh man, you know, and I'm holding this thing and they weigh like a ton. And uh, my neighbor is going, he's going, hey, hey, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my end down. And this is the thing, when you're helping someone move something, couch, dresser, I, whatever it might be when you're holding, and you're trying to manage it and then they start changing things. There's this moment in every move or someone's going, wait, 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 wait. Like we're, we're trying to get them stopped because you know at this point, I can't handle this. Like I can't do this on my own. And it kind of stops you and it shifts everything. Well, we're gonna actually look at that statement today about handling things and, and how well we do that or how well we don't do it. And so here's the phrase that you've probably said, and I know that you've heard before, and it's this, God won't give me more than I can handle. And we go, yeah. And maybe you've said it to someone. And you were trying to be helpful, right? Someone's going through something tragic or hard, uh, and man, just whatever they're handling in life is really hard, and so you look at them, and in in all honesty, like complete empathy and, and care for them, you'd go, hey, 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 God won't give you more than you can handle. And I just gotta tell you straight out, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. 
And some of you I know are, are sitting here today. We, we, we have like 130 or 40 women that are off on a retreat uh, today. They're, they're coming back. Some of you dads are here with your kids and you're going, I don't want to hear that because this is more than I can handle. Like, I'm living it today. I, I got us to church. That's about all I can do. <clears throat> but, but the truth is, is that in those deep ways, we sometimes say this, this is more than, than I can handle. And if the Bible doesn't say that, we're thinking, wait, wait a sec. Whoa, time out, Dave. Are, are you saying that God wants me to be wiped out? That God wants me to be overwhelmed by the situations and the circumstances that I face? Because Dave, I've heard you say, I know that I have. You said, God's got you and God is for you and God is with you. And like, you've said those things. And I would tell you, yes, absolutely. Those things are 100% true. But let me tell you what's wrong with this statement. And then we're gonna actually look at the scripture that kind of got twisted into this phrase. But the problem and the mistake or the struggle with this statement is that really when you, when you kind of dissect it down and tear it apart, it's all about me. It's really saying that God allows me to face these things you know, in life and I can handle it. If God's not gonna give me more than I can handle, then I've got it, right? I just need to be reminded of it. What I'm really saying is that when it's all said and done, even though I invoke God's name in it, my strength will be enough and my intellect and my wisdom will be enough and I will have enough inner strength and I'll have enough inner power and the emotional fortitude that I need will be able to handle anything. It's really a statement, I want you to hear this, that says, I am enough. I can handle it. And the Bible teaches that we are not enough, but that he is enough. That's what the Bible tells us, that he is what we need, that he is our hope, and he is our strength. And here's another thing that happens anytime we, we kind of use that, well, God won't give you more than we can handle because if you've ever felt that or had it said to you or whatever it might be, and there's this part where you're going, no, I really can't. It's too much. Like, I, I don't even know my next step. Like, you're really struggling, but again, someone says that to you out of kindness. And you know this, doesn't the enemy take that statement? and all of a sudden induce all kinds of shame into your life? Because here's what the voice in your head, I know it doesn't mind, will say, well, if you were a better Christian, if you were a better Christian, you'd be able to handle this. If you were a better Christian, you would have the strength. If you were a better Christian, you, you'd know what to do. If you hadn't made that mistake, if you hadn't made that choice, if you hadn't really messed up that part of your life, then, then you would be able to handle this now. So really, it's all on you. And man, the enemy takes that and just pours shame into our life. So when we step back a moment and we look at it and we think, well, whether it's in my personal life or in the life of someone that we love, issues and circumstances and events can spiral out of control quickly because, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, we do live in a sinful and a broken world. What we are living today and what we are experiencing today is not God's best for us. It's because of choices and sin and all that has gone on in our world. And so as we, as we walk through these things, it's in these moments we realize, this is more than I can handle. I don't know what to do in this. And I wanna to acknowledge today that some of you sitting in this room are carrying an enormous burden, a huge amount of weight of circumstances that you are walking through. And it's heavy. And you are maybe just even hearing this today going, it is more than I can handle. And maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope and that can lead to some really dark places. And just when you think it's too much to handle, doesn't it sometimes work out that something else happens? Something adds to the weight. You feel like this was enough and man, it's just one more thing. You think, what do, what do I do with that? 
So we're going to get to that, but let's, let's step back to the scripture that, that kind of got twisted in this. This is kind of where things begin to go sideways, and it comes from a moment when the Apostle Paul is writing to these Christ followers at this, at this church in a place called Corinth, and they were walking through some challenging things. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul begins to write to them about, hey, how, you're your ancestors, those who went before you, this nation of Israel, made some choices when they were out with Moses. And they chose to worship idols and there was different things that happened. And so he's talking to them about the temptation to walk away from God and do it on your own. And he is saying, listen, the temptations you face are not unique to you. The things you face have been faced by, by countless others before you. And he's not trying to trivialize those. He's just saying, hey, listen, you're not alone in this. Man, temptation is rough, temptation is hard. Temptation kinds of to, tends to hook us at our most vulnerable spot. And Paul's saying, hey, listen, listen, I get it, but just know that you're not alone in this, that God will guide you in this, that God will, will never let you be tempted in a way where you go, I sinned, but man, it, it wasn't me. He says, there's always gonna be a way out. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, and God is faithful. In other words, you can trust him. You can, you can hold on to him. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. See, here's where it got twisted. Paul was writing to us about temptation. He was writing to us about the lure into sin. And he's saying, we, we can't come to those places and go, Man, it wasn't me. That we have to own the choices and we have to own the sin in our life to find redemption and forgiveness in Christ. He says, God's faithful. He, he's gonna see you through this. But he doesn't say that life and the things that we experience, the circumstances, the situations in life, that you'll always be able to handle those things, that you have enough strength and wisdom and intellect to get your way through that. But somehow we've twisted this scripture to believe that, that we'll never face those difficult things. We'll never be in a little bit over our head. But when you go through the Bible, you find all kinds of people who were in those places of going, I can't do this. Gideon in the Old Testament was this young man and this angel came sent by God to say, Gideon, you're a mighty warrior. And he tells him, you're gonna lead God's people to victory against this enemy. And he literally finds him hiding in a hole and Gideon is like, like me? You, you've gotta be kidding. He, and and he, in so many words, he says this, I can't do that. I don't have what it takes. You got the wrong guy. It's more than I can handle. Moses told God, you need to find someone else. Man, I can't speak in front of people. I can't do this thing. You've got the wrong guy. That's way more than I can manage on my own. Jeremiah, one of the prophets in the Old Testament, he wrestled with loneliness and feelings of defeat and insecurity and even, even depression. And he was like, God, I can't do this. I can't be your spokesman. I am not your man. Have you ever read the book of Job? <sighs> Job just like, like if you read through it, you're just like, okay, I'd be tapping out at like the first thing he goes through going, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. And yet he goes through hit after hit after hit after hit. It's like, there wasn't just this, oh, hey, I can handle all this. Man, he was devastated. King David wrote Psalm after Psalm about his mental, emotional, and even his spiritual unsteadiness. Here's what he says in Psalm 38. He says, my guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. I'm exhausted and completely crushed and my groans come from an anguished heart. And if we were gonna be, just, just if I could sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, really transparent, some of you would say, I have been exactly there. I have been at that point of exhaustion and overwhelming. I am crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. Some of you would say, that's been me. And even Jesus, remember he was fully God, but he was fully man. And the human part of him, the humanity of him, uh, 
endured more than, it was just like, I, I can't handle this. In fact, here's what he says in Mark 14. He says, he became deeply troubled and distressed. And Jesus told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. It's like, this is, this is beyond me. So here's the question. And maybe it's the elephant in the room today. Why would God allow things that are beyond what we can handle, that are beyond what we can carry, that are beyond what we can sustain? I mean, does God have a purpose in that? And I will tell you that he does. He does. And it's not just delight in seeing us struggle or any of those things. But he is building something deep in us. And while he doesn't cause this, he will use the things. We talked about this a few weeks ago. He will use it all. Nothing is wasted. Every challenge, every loss, every struggle, he wants to build something deeper in us to truly make us holy. And I know it's hard. I know it's challenging. But his desire is to see us walk in a deeper faith, a deeper trust, a humble surrender a more profound joy. He desires those things in us. So what can God do in these, these moments of, ah, it's beyond what I can handle? Because when I face those things, I wanna give you three things, I want you to write them down, okay? The first is this. When I face those things, I have an opportunity to depend on his presence. Write that down. I will depend on his presence. See, here's what we all know. When things are going really good, we call it when things are up and to the right, right? Everything's like, it's just getting better and better, right? We say, yeah, I know, I, I need God, I, I need God. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't like need him, but you know, I need him. And we'll admit to that. But when everything's going well, right? Like family's good, kids are good, school's good. You know, finances are doing pretty good. Vacation's coming up. Temperatures are dropping. Like, everything is really great. So it's like, you know, no, no, I, I trust in God. But, man, if God needs to direct his attention to some people who are, like, really struggling, that'd be fine. Because I've got it. I've got it right now. I'm good. Until I'm not. I'm good until I'm not. I can handle it until I can't. It's working until it doesn't, right? Because we don't think we need God until we really need God. That's how it is. And it's easy to forget, but I'll tell you, when things go sideways, who are you gonna depend on? When things start getting out of control, our prayers go from, hey, I'm good, God, thank you, to God, where are you? God, I don't know that I can handle this. God, do you see what's going on around me? And it's ironic how quickly we run to God when life begins to spiral, but how quickly we ignore him and rely on ourselves when things are all good. So here's the question, and here's the bottom line. Whether things are great or things are hard in your life, and this is the same for me, man. This, I'm preaching to me today, too. The truth is, is that life actually is more than we can handle. Life is more than we can handle. Life is more than you can handle, it's more than I can handle. And you go, whoa, 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 wait, Dave, I, I, I mean, God gives us all, exactly. But here's the thing, we were created to live in union together with God. We were created to, to, to be with him in relationship. He didn't create us to be isolated on our own. I can handle it and push God away. We were meant to live in this place of surrender and trust and relationship with him. And so whatever you're going through today that's heavy or troublesome or painful or scary or lonely and you feel like it's too much to handle, know that God didn't design you. He didn't gift you. He didn't give all to you so that you could simply carry it by yourself. He created you to be doing life with him, and he wants you to depend on his presence. So let me say this to you. Never let the presence of your storm cause you to doubt the presence of your God. I had someone in first service tell me, Dave, you need to repeat that like three times so we can get our pen out and write that down. But let me say it to you again. Never let the presence of your storm 
cause you to doubt the presence of your God. Because it's easy to think in the middle of the storm, like, ah, is he, does he know what's going on? If you remember the story of the disciples of Jesus, they're out in the boat, right? Storms are going, if you've ever seen, there's a, there's a classic uh, painting of it. And they're all, you know, scrambling, trying to get the sails down and, you know, do all these different things and control what's going on. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. And finally they come back and they go, Jesus, <laughs> like, do you see what's going on? And Jesus says, your faith is so small. And he doesn't say it wagging his finger at him, but it's like, I'm here. I'm with you. Like, the I've got you in this. See, God is never gonna abandon you. He's never gonna forsake you. And we know this, our friends might, our families sometimes do, but Jesus never will. He will be with you no matter what. And he wants you near his presence. He wants you to remember him as you're facing those things. There's this passage in 2 Corinthians, and you don't need to turn there, but the Apostle Paul is, is sharing with this church again in Corinth some of the things that they went through on their journeys to, to share Christ all throughout the, the known world at that time. And in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, Paul writes this. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. Listen to this. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. And we have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. Now the last part of that passage will go, whoa, 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 see, God's coming through. God's not giving them more than they can handle, right? But you missed the first part of it. Because he says, this was beyond what we could handle. This is beyond what we could endure. We're not sure. And then he says this, but as a result of experiencing more than we could handle, what happened? We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. I'm gonna make an assumption here. I don't know that Paul would have got to that place if he hadn't uh, had to live through the experiences that were more than he could handle. Sometimes when we walk through the fire, when we walk through that storm, we learn things that we couldn't learn in any other way. We experience things that we couldn't experience in any other way. He learned to rely on God rather than himself because life got hard. Man, did you see what he said? Underline it if you've got your Bible. We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. Likewise, in the hardest seasons of life when it feels like everything is slipping away and maybe you can't even see straight because of the emotional storms that are going on, you can depend on his presence. Here's what David wrote. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. And James, in the New Testament, he said, come close to God and God will come close to you. So yes, God sometimes allows us to experience more than we can handle because he wants to accomplish something more that we can begin to depend on his presence. Write this down for number two. I will trust him in the process. <clears throat> I will tell you, when I look back on my life and I realize uh, Gina and I have said this over and over, we have felt so incredibly blessed and cared for by God. But it doesn't mean that life has always been easy, that we haven't faced trials and challenges and things that, I mean, just have taken us to the very edge. I mean, we have. And in those situations, there have been things that have been far beyond what I can handle. And I'm convinced that in the midst of those hard things was the opportunity God offered for me to draw close to him in his presence. That's what we just looked at. But it was also in those moments that I began to pray differently with a different kind of urgency. And maybe you've been there too. That I've experienced his peace when it didn't make sense at all. Still hard, still stressful. But man, I knew he was sustaining me through that. And I've shared before, um, I, I just call them prayer bites. Sometimes these little simple prayers. Like they're not a mantra, they're nothing like that. It's just coming back to the simplicity and reminder of who God really is. 
And there's one that I have prayed so many times because I know, like you, you've, you've probably had those sleepless nights. There's something going on, some conflict, some challenge, some loss, and it just, it, it, you can't even sleep. And you've probably prayed in the middle of the night, God, I don't know what to do in this. God, would you help me? And I have this little prayer that I, and it, it comes out of scripture, but it, it's one I've tried to rely on my own, that I have strained to make things happen that I need to be reminded to rely on him. And here's the prayer that I pray. In Jesus' name and not my strain. Man, I've prayed that so many times. Like, Jesus, in your name, not my strain, not my push, not, not me relying on me, but I'm simply relying on you. And in those moments, it's like Jesus saying, I've got you. You can't handle this alone, but this is your moment to depend on me and trust me like never before because nothing is wasted. God's going to use it all. And he will tell us, hey, listen, I'm at work in this, so trust my process. I know a lot of times we talk about a mountaintop experience from God. Have you ever heard that? It's like, whew, everything was just amazing and wonderful. And God, you know, sometimes we go to a retreat or something like that, it's like, oh man, it was a mountaintop experience, right? Nothing, nothing was like it, and they are wonderful. But I will tell you, for me, my valleys have been the place where I've experienced God in such profound ways. You see, on the mountaintop, everything's good, everything feels good, everything's great, and I can kind of get distracted that way. But in the valley, man, sometimes it's just like me and God. And to be honest with you, I think that's exactly how God wants it. He wants me to kind of come to a place where I realize, God, you have my full attention. And in some of those valleys, he has my full attention. And for me, I'd rather be in the valley with Jesus than on the mountaintop without him. I'd rather be right down there where it's hard and where it's hurt, knowing that he is with me, because that's where the growth happens. That's where the maturity takes place. That's where it's more of him and less of me. It, it's like John, uh, John the Baptist, when they were asking him about Jesus, he said this, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. Like he understood this process that was really hard, but we wanted more and more of Jesus. So let me give you one more. When things are hard, I will experience his power. Write that down. I'll experience his power. I remember when our kids were little, like, like baby little, and we used to have the car seat that clicked into place, and then you could pull it out and be like a baby carrier. Yeah, remember these things? And so we had, you know, these, these little babies, right? You know, and they're, they're less than 10 pounds. Well, one of them was more than 10 pounds, but most of them were under 10 pounds. And you know, you, you, you kind of hang it over your arm, right? Parents, you've done this, and you got the baby there, it's no big deal, and you got a diaper bag, you got like a couple diapers and a bottle in there. Like, what's the big deal? And you just walk around, it's no big deal. Go to Target, go to an amusement park, go to a ball game, it's no big deal. Until you're lugging that kid for an hour. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, when did this kid get so heavy? Right? And I remember one time Gina actually went to the doctor. She was having some problems like with her shoulder stuff and they were trying to figure it out. And they go, well, do you like do anything with it? He's like, no, not really. It's like, do you have a baby? Yeah, well, there's your problem right there, right? <laughs> it's like it starts messing you up and it's just like this little baby. It's like, what's going on? Because no matter how, how light that baby may be, no matter how light that diaper bag may be, if you give it enough time it becomes unbearable. This is a big, giant, three-pound dumbbell. <laughs> right? I mean, you, I don't care who you are in this room. You could be a kid in this room. You could probably curl this like, like crazy. And if I asked you to hold it out, you go, no, no problem. Two minutes from now, five minutes from now, 15 minutes from now, this three pounds, it'd be taking you out. I don't care how much you work out. I don't care how big your biceps and your shoulders are. Given enough time, that three pound weight will take you out. 
It just does. Because no matter how light something seems, given enough time, it becomes unbearable for us. And we can't, we can't manage it anymore. Sooner or later, it gets too heavy. The Apostle Paul went through something similar. And while he didn't call it a burden or anything like that, he, he used the phrase, he had a thorn in his side, something that stuck there that was, was just hard. And we don't even know what it was. Scripture doesn't tell us. And people have speculated for you know, all these centuries. We, we just don't know. But three times, it says he, he begged God, would you, would you just take this from me? And as I was processing this, I thought, man, we all have our thorns, don't we? We all have a weight that we carry. It could be dysfunction in your marriage or in your family. It, it could be a health issue or a health problem that you're dealing with. It could be an addiction. It could be emotions and an internal conflict that is going on within you, and at times it just seems overwhelming. And you may even pray, God, I'm begging you, would you just take this one thing from me? And we pray, and then it's like nothing happens. And now we're going like, really, God? It was just this one thing. That, that, that's all that I asked. My one big ask, can, can you do this? And man, those are, those are hard situations. Those are hard challenges. But I want you to hear what the apostle Paul said as he walked through this. This is in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and the hardships and the persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's, a, that's hard, right? I think that passage is one of the most challenging, convicting, difficult things for us to wrestle through. It's like, but why, why wouldn't you take it away? And did you see what God told him? In your weakness, my strength is made evident. See, when, we're, when we've got it all together, we go, oh yeah, 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 I trust in God, but really, I've got it. But when I'm weak, hey guys, this is all God. This is all him. He's the one who's doing it. So Paul says, guess what? I'm gonna celebrate my weaknesses because it makes, it, it kind of points back to Jesus. Because I have to depend on the one whose power goes beyond my power. When I'm weak and I can't do it on my own, I have to declare and admit that in my own strength and in my own kind of working things out, I can't do it. I need him. So let me tell you this as we close. Without Jesus, even the lightest burdens get to be too heavy. They may be light at the beginning, but eventually they become more than we can handle because we're not depending on God's presence and power in the process. But what if we were to pray, Jesus, I can't do this without you. It's too much. Jesus, even the little things have been overwhelming to me and I'm anxious about what's coming. So I just need to know that you're close. I just need to know that you're here. I just need to know that your strength is made evident in my weakness. I need your presence, and I need your power at work within me. What if we prayed that? What if we came in a place of surrender and had that? What, what kind of example would our lives be? What would it show to the people around me? It's not about what I can manage, it's about the power of Christ in me. So here's my challenge for you this week. Sometime when you're having a quiet time, I want you to get a little piece of paper out, okay? You can even use the notes that you got today. And I want you to name that heavy weight, that burden in your life. Like actually name it. So I had this little three pound weight up here. What's your weight that you're carrying? That the more you carry it, it's gonna get heavier and heavier. Is it an addiction? Is it your career? Is it your finances? Your kids? Your marriage? Is it cancer? Depression? Bitterness? Unforgiveness? Conflict? What is it that you're carrying right now that you're just going, man, I don't know. Would you admit that it's more than you can handle? 
Would you admit you can't do it on your own? And would you surrender it to Jesus? Because you weren't meant to handle it on your own. This is our moment when we get to stop relying on ourselves and we start relying on him. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, today we just want to say thank you that in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our suffering and challenges, God, we just want it to be over. We just want a microwave solution. We just want it to be quickly done and passed. And so we power up and we try to manage and be smart enough and strong enough. And Lord, the truth is when we can't, sometimes we just bail. Sometimes we run. Sometimes we numb the pain with activity or alcohol or whatever it might be. We just, we just can't handle it anymore. But instead today, you invite us to come to you to find your strength, to experience your hope, to experience your presence, your power at work within us. And it comes not as we power up, but as we actually admit that we don't have what it takes, that we need you. And today, Lord, we are desperate for you. So thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us and abandon us. Thank you, Lord, that you've got us no matter what. So we thank you and we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I want to finish today, I want to read you uh, a passage from Matthew 11. This has become, over these past few years, one of my favorite passages. I'm going to read it to you in the message translation. But here's Jesus talking. And he says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Then come to me and get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. So walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That's my prayer for you this week. That's Jesus' words for you. You can learn to live and walk in a new way as you trust him. Hey, thanks for being here today. Go in the grace of God. Be a light in this world. Have a good week.